everyone. Welcome back to theCUBE's coverage of AWS Public Sector Summit here in Washington, D.C. We're live on the ground for two days, face-to-face -face conferences, an expo hall and everything here, with Keith Brooks, who's the director and head of technical business development for AWS Government, GovCloud, Selling Brain's 10th birthday. Congratulations. Welcome to theCUBE. Thank you, John. Happy to be so here. So EC2 is 15. Yeah. S3 is nine and a half, or no, that may be their 10, because that's the same day as SQS. So GovCloud, 10 years. 10 what years. A, I mean, what a time flies. 10 years, big milestone. Big so milestone. congratulations, a lot of history involved in GovCloud. Yes. Um, take us through, what's the current situation? Yeah, so um, let's start with what it is, just for the viewers that may not be familiar. So AWS GovCloud is isolated AWS cloud infrastructure and services that were purposely built for our US government customers that had highly sensitive data or highly regulated data or applications or workloads that they wanted to move to the cloud. So we gave customers the ability to do that with AWS GovCloud. It is subject to the FedRAMP High and DOD SRG IL-4, IL-5 baselines. It gives customers the ability to address ITAR requirements as well as CJIS, NIST, CMMC, and FIPS requirements and gives customers a multi-region architecture that allows them to also design for disaster recovery and high availability. Yeah. Um, in terms of why we built it, it starts with our customers. It was yeah. pr pretty clear from the government that they needed a highly secure and highly compliant cloud infrastructure to innovate ahead of demand, and that's what we delivered. So back in August of 2011, we launched AWS GovCloud, which gave customers the best of breed in terms of high technology, high security, high compliance in the cloud to allow them to innovate for their mission critical workloads. Who were some of the early customers when you guys launched? Obviously the CIA deal, Health and Community, that was a big one, but what were some of the early customers? So the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Veterans Affairs, the Department of Justice, and the Department of Defense were all early users of AWS GovCloud. But one of our earliest Lighthouse customers was the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And NASA JPL used AWS GovCloud to procure, procure IT resources ahead of demand, which allowed them to save money and also take advantage of being efficient and only paying for what they needed. But they went beyond just IT operations. Yeah. They also looked at how do they use the cloud and specifically GovCloud for their mission programs. So if you think back to all the way to 2012 with the Mars Curiosity rover, NASA JPL actually streamed and processed and stored that data from the Curiosity rover on AWS GovCloud. They actually streamed over 150 terabytes of data, responded to over 80,000 requests per second, and took it beyond just imagery. They actually did high performance yeah. compute and data analytics on the data as well that led to additional efficiencies for future rover missions. So they weren't tire kicking. They no. were actually hardcore, mission, leaning into it. Mission critical workloads that also adhere to ITAR compliance, which is why they used yeah. AWS GovCloud. Yeah. Uh, all these compliance, so, so there's also these levels. I remember when I was uh, working on the Jedi uh, stories that were out, there was always like level four, there's always different classifications. What does all that mean? Like, and then there's highly available data and highly high availability. All these words mean something in these top secret clouds. Right. Can you take us through kind of the meanings of those? Yeah, absolutely. So it starts with the federal compliance program, and the two most popular programs are FedRAMP and DOD SRG. FedRAMP is more general for federal government agencies. There are three levels, low, moderate, and high. And the short and skinny of those levels is how they align to the FISMA requirements of the government. So there's FISMA low, FISMA moderate, and FISMA high. And depending on the sensitivity of the government data, you will have to align to those levels of FedRAMP to use workloads and store data in the cloud. Similar story for DOD with SRG, uh, impact levels two, That's four, five, and six. Uh, impacts levels two, four, and five are all for unclassified data. Level two is for less sensitive public defense data. Levels four and five cover more sensitive defense data to include mission critical national security systems. And impact level six is for classified information. So those form the basis of security and compliance. Luckily, with AWS GovCloud celebrating our 10th anniversary, we address FedRAMP high for our customers that require that and DOD impact levels two, four, and five for our sensitive defense yeah, customers. Yeah, and, and that was a real nuanced point, and a lot of the competition can't do that. Correct. Uh, and that's real, people don't understand, you know, this company versus that company, and all the lobbying and all the mudslinging that goes on, we've seen that uh, in the industry, it's unfortunate, but it happens. Um, I do want to ask you about the FedRAMP, because what I'm seeing on the commercial side, in the cloud ecosystem, a lot of companies that aren't, quote, targeting public sector, are coming in on the FedRAMP, so right. there's some good, traction there. 
you guys have done a lot of work that accelerate that. What, any, new, any new information to share there? Yeah, so we've been committed to, fed, uh, to supporting the federal government compliance requirements effectively since the launch of GovCloud. And we've demonstrated our commitment to FedRAMP over the last number of years. And GovCloud specifically, we've taken dozens of services through FedRAMP High. And we're 100% committed to it because we have great relationships with the FedRAMP JAB or the Joint Authorization Board. We work with individual government agencies to secure agency ATOs. And in fact, we actually have more agency ATOs with AWS GovCloud than any other cloud provider. And the short and skinny is that represents the baseline for cloud security to address sensitive government workloads yeah. and sensitive government data. And what we're seeing from industry, and specifically highly regulated industries, is the standard that the U.S. government set means that they have the assurance to run controlled and classified information or other levels of highly sensitive data on the cloud as well. well so FedRAMP set that standard. Yeah, what I see about the GovCloud, this is an ecosystem within an ecosystem again, yeah. and, and within crossover sections. So for instance, um, the impact of not getting FedRAMP certified is basically money. Right. <laughs> I mean, like if you're a right. supplier, a right. vendor, a uh, software developer or whatever, right. it used to be a miracle. No one, no one went in. <laughs> right. <laughs> like FedRAMP, I'm going to have to hire a whole department. Right. Now you guys have a really easy, this is a key value proposition, isn't it? Correct, and you see it with a number of ISVs and software as a service providers. If you visit the FedRAMP Marketplace website, you'll see dozens of providers that have FedRAMP authorized third-party SaaS products running on GovCloud. Industry-leading uh, SaaS companies like Salesforce.com, Druva Technology, Splunk, SAP NS2, yep. Effectively, they're bringing their best of breed capabilities, building on top of AWS GovCloud, and offering those highly compliant FedRAMP moderate, FedRAMP high capabilities to customers, both in government and private industry that need that level of compliance. Yeah, just as an aside, I saw they've got a nice tweet from Teresa Carlson, now at Splunk on yeah. GovCloud yesterday. So that was a nice little yeah. positive gesture yeah. uh, on, on, for you guys at GovCloud. What other areas are you guys moving the needle on? Because architecturally, this is a big deal. Yeah. What are some areas that you're moving the needle on for the GovCloud? Well, when I look back across the last 10 years, there were some pretty important developments that stand out. The first is us launching the second GovCloud infrastructure region in 2018. Mm -hmm. And that gave customers that use GovCloud, specifically customers that have highly sensitive data and high levels of compliance, the ability to build fault tolerant, highly available, and mission critical workloads in the cloud in a region that also gives them an additional three availability zones. So the launch of GovCloud East, which is named AWS GovCloud US East, gave customers two regions, a total of six availability zones, that allowed them to accelerate and build more scalable solutions in the cloud. Uh, more recently, there is an emergence of another DOD program called the Cybersecurity Maturity Model, CMMC. And CMMC is something where we looked around the corner and said, we need to innovate to help our customers, particularly our defense customers and the defense industrial based customers address CMMC requirements in the cloud. So with GovCloud, back in December of 2020, we actually launched the AWS compliant framework for federal and defense workloads, which gives customers a turnkey capability and tooling and resources to spin up environments that are configured, to meet CMMC controls and DOD SRG controls. So, so those things represent some of the evolution. Yeah, Keith, I'm interested also in your thoughts on how you see the progression of GovCloud outside the United States. Yeah. Um, tactical Edge, you got Wavelength coming on board. How, does, how do you guys look at that? Obviously, the US is global. Uh, it's not just the Jedi thing, it's more of, in general, Edge right. deployments. Right. Sovereignty is also going to be, world's flat, right? Correct. I mean. So how does that work? So it starts back with customer requirements, and, and I tie it back to the first question. Effectively, we built GovCloud to respond to our U.S. government customers and our highly regulated industry customers that had highly sensitive data and a high bar to meet in terms of regulatory compliance. And that's the foundation of it. So as we look to other customers, to include those outside of the U.S., it starts with those requirements. You mentioned things like edge and hybrid. And a good example of how we marry the two is when we launched AWS Outpost in GovCloud last year. So Outpost brings the power of the AWS cloud to on-premises environments of our customers, whether it's their data centers or colo environments by bringing AWS services, APIs, and service endpoints to the customer's on-premises uh, facilities. So even outside the United States? Well, for GovCloud, it's focused on our U.S. Only, customers. Okay, uh, right now. Um, outside of the U.S., customers also have availability to use Outpost. It's just 
for our U.S. customers, it's focused on outpost availability. So you're, it's just a geography right now, U.S. Right. But other governments are going to want their GovCloud too, right? Right. That's and what it, you're getting at. Right. And it starts with the data, right? Okay. So we 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 spend a lot of time working with government agencies across the globe to understand their regulations and their requirements, and we use that to drive our decisions. And again, just like we started with GovCloud ten years ago. It starts with our customer requirements and we innovate from there. Well, I, I love the DOD's vision on this. I know Jedi didn't come through and kind of went scuttled, got thrown under the bus or whatever how it was, you want to call it. But that whole idea of a tactical edge is a pretty brilliant yeah. uh, idea. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing more of that. And that's where Outpost comes in. You get Snowball, Snowmobile, all right. the little snow, snow products as well. How are they doing? And Because and, they're all part of the family too. They are. And they're available in GovCloud, and they're also authorized at FedRAMP and DoD SRG levels. And it's really, it's really fascinating to see DoD innovate with the cloud, right? Yeah. So you mentioned tactical edge. So whether it's snowball devices or using outposts in the future, I think the DoD and our defense customers are going yeah. to continue to innovate. And quite frankly, for us, it represents our commitment to this space. We want to make sure our defense customers and the defense industrial base, defense contractors, have access yeah. to the best of breed capabilities like those edge devices and edge yeah. capabilities. And I think you got the, the impact of certifications, which is good because as I was just talking to Clint Crozier, we've got aerospace coming in, now you've got DoD. A little bit of a, you know, cross-pollinization, if you will. Yeah. So nice to have that flexibility. I've uh, got to ask you about uh, just how you view, just in general, the in intelligence community. Mm -hmm. A lot of uptake since the CIA deal uh, with Amazon. Um, just overall, good health for AWS GovCloud. Absolutely, and, and again, it starts with our commitment to our customers. We want to make sure that our national security customers, our defense customers, and all of the customers in the federal government that have a responsibility for securing the country have access to the best of breed capability. So whether it's the intelligence community, the Department of Defense, or other federal agencies. And quite frankly, we see them innovating and driving things forward to include with their sensitive workloads they run in GovCloud. What's your strategy for partnerships as you work on the ecosystem? You deal a lot with strategy, go to market, partnerships. Um, it's, it's, it's public sector, pretty much do people all know each other? Um, are new firms popping up, new brands? What's the, what's the ecosystem look like? Yeah, it's pretty diverse. So for GovCloud specifically, if you look at partners in the defense community, we work with aerospace companies like Lockheed Martin and Raytheon Technologies to help them build ITAR compliant, ERP applications, software development environments, et cetera. We work with software companies, I mentioned Salesforce.com, Splunk, and SAP and S2. Uh, and then even at the state and local government level, there's a company called Payit that actually worked with the state of Kansas yeah. to develop the ICANN app, which is pretty fascinating. <laughs> it's a app that is the official app of the state of Kansas that allows citizens to interact with citizen services. That's all through a partner. So we continue to work yeah. with our partner, uh, broad a the AWS partner uh, network to bring yeah. those type of capabilities. You got a lot of customers. MSPs that are doing good work here. I saw some of that out here. Uh, 10 years, congratulations. Yes. What's the coolest thing uh, you've done or seen? Oh wow, it's hard to name anything in particular. Um, I, I just think for us, it's just seeing the customers and the federal government innovate, yeah. right? And, and tie that innovation to mission critical workloads that are highly important. Again, it reflects our commitment to give these government customers and the government contractors the best of breed capabilities and some of the innovation we just see coming from the federal government, yeah. leveraging the cloud now is just super cool. So hard to pinpoint one specific thing, I know, but, yes. I, but I love the innovation in general. It's hard to pick the favorite child, is that? Yeah. So we always say, it's kind of a trick question. <laughs> I do have to ask you about just in general, the um, just in 10 years, just look at the agility. Yeah. I mean, if you told me 10 years ago the government would be moving at some, any, any agile anything, they were a glacier. Yeah. Um, in terms of change, yeah. right? Procurement, you name it. It's just like it's a racket. Yeah, right? it's a racket. So, so, but they're not. They weren't. They were slow. Yeah, they had money. Yeah. Now, pandemic hits this year, last year. Everything's up, up for grabs. The, yes. the script has been flipped. Exactly. And you know what? What's interesting is there were actually a few federal government agencies that really paved the way for what you're seeing today. I'll give you some examples. So the Department of Veterans Affairs, they were an early GovCloud user. And way back in 2015, they launched Vets.gov on GovCloud, which is an online platform that gave veterans the ability to apply for, manage, and track their benefits. Those type of initiatives paved the way for what you're seeing today. Even as soon as last year with the U.S. Census, right? 
they brought the decennial count online for the first time in history last year during 2020, during the pandemic. Yeah. And the Census Bureau was able to use GovCloud to launch and run 2020census.gov in the cloud at scale to secure that data. So those are examples of federal agencies that really kind of yeah. paved the way and leading to what you're seeing today. It's kind of an awakening. It is. And I think one of the things that no, no one's reporting is kind of a cultural revolution is the talent underneath that wave. The yes. younger people are like, finally. <laughs> like, and so it's cooler. It is. It's when you go fast and you can make things change, skeptics turn into naysayers, turn into like out of job or they don't transform. So like that whole blocker mentality gets exposed. Right. Just like shelfware software. Right. You don't know what it does until in the cloud. It's not performing. It's not good. Right. Right. <laughs> right. I mean, and to that point, that's why we spend a lot of time focused on education programs and upskilling the workforce too, because we want to ensure that as our customers mature and as they innovate, uh, we're providing the right training and resources to help them along their journey. Keith Brooks, great conversation, Thank you. Uh, great insight, and, and historian too, taking <laughs> us through the, the, the early days of GovCloud. Thanks for yep. coming on theCUBE. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. This is CUBE's coverage here at AWS Public Sector Summit. We'll be back with more coverage after this short break.